I don't normally cover leaks, but the new goodies from BlackBerry seem almost dribbled out officially in order to keep interest high. This is a video peek at the upcoming Z10 with 4.2 inch screen, gesture based interface and 2GB of RAM. The official unveiling is on the 30th, so watch out for a lot more in Phone Show 192. Samsung has officially revealed the Galaxy S2 Plus, effectively a slightly updated S2 with Jelly Bean out of the box, the latest touch Wiz cosmetics and NFC in every unit now. Other specs remain the same as far as I can see. Is there still room for the S2 in 2013? Me think Samsung's range is getting rather confusing. This is something that often crops up in spec sheets since I've never really covered it properly. Stabilisation by which I mean having your phone captured videos stabilised to try and take out some of the natural shake that occurs when you try and film things handheld as opposed to putting the phones in a tripod or a mount of some kind. There are, after all, several ways to tell video was shot on a phone. For starters, there's usually more digital noise in the frame because the phone sensor is a heck of a lot smaller than a camcorder's. Also, panning shots are a lot jerkier, partly because of the hardware limitations in the phone, but mostly because the phone is so relatively small and light that you naturally swing it around a lot faster than you would a full video camera. Most people pan three or four times too fast when shooting video on a phone. Another way to tell is that the footage is jerkier with such a light device. There's very little inertia to stop every tremble of your hands producing small movement in the framing of your subject during filming. One answer, of course, is a bulky stabilisation rig like this one, but another is to use software or hardware in the phone to stabilise your video. Most top-end phones now have video stabilisation built into their camera software. There are enough pixels available on a sensor that a degree of software stabilisation can be achieved. The question is, should you turn it on or not? Simplifying slightly, what happens is that the pixels around your chosen subject are also captured, and the content of each frame analysed looking for small changes in the position of high contrast details. If found, the overall frame of pixels is effectively offset and if necessary even rotated by the appropriate amount, so that when playback later the high contrast details appear in the same place throughout and the video looks a lot smoother, all in real time. Wow, <laughs> that's how fast today's camera chips are, in theory. As I said, that's simplified but you get the idea. One downside is that the extra degree of image processing does degrade the video image slightly, not least because when you do want to pan around a scene or reframe something, at what point do your intentional movements become big enough to stop correcting for what also might just be your hand trembling a bit? So you typically get a jerking when panning or moving slowly, the image is held steady and then the software realises what you're doing and jumps to the new image frame and so on. Another slight drawback is that the field of view is reduced slightly with your chosen 1080p video image now coming from the central 90% of the sensor rather than the usual 95% or so, i.e. there's enough margin around the core view to allow for stabilisation corrections. And to a small degree there's also a reduction in the light gathered and thus overall quality. In practice most phones on most platforms come with software stabilisation turned off for just these reasons. The only circumstances in which it makes 100% sense to turn it on are when you're filming a fairly static scene and are wishing you'd brought along a tripod or a phone mount, for example a school play from a fixed vantage point or someone talking against a fixed backdrop. And this is with video stabilisation turned on in software. Again a pretty static scene but my hands trembling holding the phone at full stretch and my face is moving. Let's see how well the software stabilisation does. Under these circumstances, there's no panning and there's enough fixed detail that the software can get to work. The rest of the time, my advice is to stick with the default and leave it off. But regular viewers will already have remembered that there's an elephant in the room here. Several manufacturers, of which Nokia are the first with their Lumia 920, are apparently working on getting optical image stabilisation built into phone cameras. The 920's camera sits in a shell of minute electromechanical springs with its position corrected 500 times a second in response to accelerometer input. OIS gives steadier stills and smoothed out video capture with none of the downsides of software stabilisation. It's effectively a steady cam inside your phone and it does work as shown here. Actually, there's another elephant in the room turning into quite a zoo. <laughs> there are many ways to stabilise your video after capturing it using a desktop video editor or even just uploading to YouTube and accepting its offer, 
we've detected your video is shaky. Would you like us to stabilize it? <laughs> of course, this is also software stabilization. And again, there's some degradation and jerking for many small movements. Situations where the algorithms at YouTube then get it wrong in terms of your intentions, but worth noting. In the meantime, look out for OIS, optical image stabilization. I think it really is the future for all our phone cameras. Yes, yes, the window's back. It's snowing and this is the UK, so it's rather unusual. I thought you'd like to see it. I'm mused on the phone show podcast recently as the number of phones on my desk, all of which could, with a few pros and cons here and there, fulfill what I needed a smartphone to do, which got me thinking. How far back could I go in time before the hardware or software wasn't enough? In other words, when did this wonderful state of affairs begin? Let's take it platform by platform since the cutoff date will vary slightly in each case. iOS is the easiest to tackle. The iPhone was created in 2007, but the Classic and the 3G are now far too limited and too slow. We live with a 3G on iOS 4 here for a year and it was torture. <laughs> The uh, 3GS is iOS 6 compatible and still worth a punt second hand, but it's a borderline case. The 2010 iPhone 4 still works well, and with its build quality, I'd say it's where I draw the line for iOS, assuming you didn't need Siri, which is 4S and up only. The world of Android is far more complicated, with dozens of manufacturers and a gamut of no less than five major versions of the OS on the go. Froyo and Gingerbread, that's Android 2.2 and 2.3, released in late 2010, marked the point at which I could seriously start to recommend Android as being complete, not least because applications could be installed to mass memory or card. Happily, there is a vast array of potentially compatible phones that you do have to watch out for the 90% or so which are stuck with low system disk space. Anyone remember my attempt at using the Motorola XT720 again recently? Low RAM and poor component quality, or indeed all three. There are some decent gingerbread devices, though not least the various Motorola Defies just replaced the default launcher and you're halfway there, plus some of the Sony Ericsson devices like the ARP. Go with devices which ship with Android 4, ice cream sandwich, or above, and you're safe, of course. What about taking an older device designed for Froyo or gingerbread and applying an ice cream sandwich update? Approach with caution. There have been some horror stories of devices slowed to a crawl this way. Stick with the OS the device came with if you're not 100% sure. In the Symbian world, tempting though it is to go really retro with the likes of the N86, which is all the sat nav goodness and that stunning camera. Even I'll admit that a quarter of EGA screen doesn't cut it in 2013, while the NHD resistive screen S65 edition devices leave a lot to be desired in terms of 2013 smoothness. And I'd now only half recommend this uh, capacitive screened boombox Nokia X6, which all leaves the 10 or so Symbian 3 Anna Bell devices shipped since winter 2010, so Nokia N80, 7, C7, E6, and so forth. Anything from this generation will be fine in terms of apps and performance, even today. And most have gotten several major OS updates to keep things fresh. What about Windows Phone, the newcomer on the block with the first devices only arriving in 2010 again? Interestingly, all these older devices are getting the update to Windows Phone 7.8, although technical reasons mean that they can never run the newer Windows Phone 8. It's not a huge issue at the moment, but give it a few months when more and more apps are optimized for WP8 and these WP7 devices, here's the Lumia 710, will be adequate, but nothing more, I think. If you're a Windows Phone fan, it's definitely worth picking up one of the newer Windows Phone 8 devices. Having started by saying that the cutoff date will vary by platform, I've now established that in fact, it's the same for all major platforms. 2010 is the magic year. By anything made before mid 2010, and you're gonna get frustrated, whichever platform you choose, by app compatibility and by performance. Buy with the usual care and attention, naturally a decent phone made after mid 2010, and you'll likely be fine throughout the whole of 2013. Call this Steve's two and a half year rule, perhaps, in which case I'll be checking if it's still valid come the end of 2013.